Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to every one of you and special welcome to any visitors who may be worshipping with us. There will be tea and coffee after the service, so please do take some time to come along and enjoy further fellowship. Uh, there are no other intimations this morning, so let us begin worshipping God and we do so uh, as we uh, read our call to worship from uh, Peter's, First Peter chapter 5. Verses 8 to 11, page 298 in the New Testament. Be alert, be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Be firm in your faith and resist him, because you know that you, your fellow believers in all the world are going through the same kind of sufferings. But after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who calls you to share his eternal glory and union with Christ, with himself perfect you and give you firmness, strength and a sure foundation. To, be, uh, to him be the power forever. Amen. Let us join in uh, the prayer as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your grace. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us stand together and worship God as we sing our first hymn, Mission Praise number 445, Lord the light of your love is shining. Welcome to our service this morning. The Sunday School are going to be participating in the children's address today and each of them have been preparing a small piece that we'd like to share with you. So I'd like to welcome, first of all, Megan. And Megan's going to share a reading with us followed by the bubbles who are waiting very excitedly to sing for us after that. Our Bible readings today revolve around the themes of mother and love. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 to 3. Children, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents, for this is the right thing to do. Respect your father and mother, mother is the first commandment, and have a promise added, so that all may go well with you, and you may live a long time in the land.
bubbles before we even begin, can I just say that was the best singing I've ever heard. You made four people sound like 40 this morning. <laughs> well done. I think that deserves another big clap. Okay, so bubbles were busy practicing their singing over the past few weeks and Splash Group, we've been thinking about applying our thoughts and feelings to finding adjectives to describe our mum. So this, we had a lot of conversation about this in our group time, didn't we? And first of all, I'm going to come to <laughs> Lucy. We've been thinking about lots of adjectives beginning with mmm that might describe our mum. And we had to think about reasons why that best word for our mum. So Lucy picked her favourite. So Lucy, do you want to tell everybody mmm was for? Mighty. Mighty. And now we were scratching our heads thinking, remember Lucy's mum is in the group at the same time thinking, what's Lucy going to say? <laughs> My mum is mighty. And I know she's not got her superhero cape on this morning. I think it's hiding under her jacket. Why is your mum mighty? Because she lifts heavy, heavy things into the law. Well done, <laughs> Mum. That deserves a round of applause. So, mm is for mighty. My mum lifts heavy things out of it. She's got big muscles under her jacket as well, I think. And then we had, oh, now Nicole and I were speaking about this this morning. Oh, we picked obey. And we had to think of a time that we obeyed our mum. But Nicole, some people in the group, it took them a wee while to think of a time <laughs> that they did that and they actually didn't think that that was their favourite adjective. But Nicole, there was no hesitation with you. You thought of something straight away. So would you like to share that with everyone? I obeyed my mum when she told me to make a Get Well Soon card from a friend. That was lovely. So well done to you. Oh, for a B. Now, T, actually one of our members that picked T isn't here this morning. That was Kyle. And he went, we had lots of adjectives for T. We had talented, we had ticklish, we had tender-hearted. But no, he picked tactile. He thought, hmm. We're, we're, we're dead, we're up leveling things, aren't we? In class group. But his reason was lovely. He said, My mum is tactile because she likes to hold my hand and hug me. So that was a lovely reason. <laughs> right, where are we? We're on to H now. H is for, and look, pick this one. Look, H is for. Happy. Happy, which is lovely. And we all know your mum is happy all the time, but I like to reason, best of all, why you picked happy. Can you remember and share with everybody? why? When was your mum most happy? When I was born. When I was born. So that was lovely. <laughs> right, oh, we're nearly there. Bubbles, only two more to go. We're on to E for... And the word we picked for E was encouraging. My mum is encouraging. And Alexander didn't want to be, but encouraging was good, mum. <laughs> so my mum was encouraging. Can you share with everyone? To make me have neater handwriting. To make me have neater handwriting. Well done, mum. <laughs> and Finally, we come to R, and Gwen wanted to share R with us, and we picked responsible, right, Gwen? My mum is responsible because she takes care of Lucy when I'm at work. Oh. Okay. So before we hand over to Lindsay, who's going to come up next from our good group, we wanted to share with you a verse that we've been working on. We're going to go back into our groups after this. We're going to be working on this verse for our Mother's Day card and gift this morning. You hugged me, you comforted me, 
You taught me right from wrong. You supported me. You stood up for me. You helped me to stay strong. I thank you. I love you from the bottom of my heart. And everything I ever do, you will always be a part. Will we say Happy Mother's Day to all our mums after three? One, two, three. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, boys and girls. And I'd like to ask Lindsay if she'd come up next to share our next reading with us, please. This reading is about Hannah, who desperately wants to be a mother. First Samuel chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. One time, after they had finished their meal in the house of... In the, in the house of the Lord at Shiloh, Hannah got up. She was deeply distressed and she cried bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. Meanwhile, Eli the priest was sitting in his place by the door. Hannah made a solemn promise. Almighty Lord, look at me, your servant. See my trouble and remember me. Don't forget me. If you give me a son, I promise that I will dedicate him to you for his whole life and that he will never have a haircut. What mums do. Cook and clean, wash and fold, keep me warm when I'm cold. Drive me here, take me there, and mum, you sure are everywhere. School and sports, we have such fun, and you're there when our day is done. Tuck me in, to bed so tight, that is when we say good night. I asked my friends what makes your mum great. They told me that she was their mate. They asked me why my mum's the best. I gave them this list and told them I'm blessed. Cooking dinner, cuddles play, singing, dancing, music all day. Driving, walking, raising a bike, mum knows exactly what I like. Homework, reading, computer fun, endless weekends watching me run. Solving puzzles, block towers that sway, keeping up with me all day. Friends come over and she cooks us treats. We get stuck into all of our sweets. Tucking me in with a book and a song, even though her day was long. This is why I would have to say a very big Happy Mother's Day. <clears throat> this reading is about love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 7. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or conceited or proud. Love is not ill-mannered or selfish or irritable. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love is not happy with evil, but is happy with the truth. Love never gives up, and its faith, hope, and patience never fail. Okay, thank you, children. Uh, let me just say a wee prayer for you. I mean, God, we thank you for the gift of families. Friends, cousins, aunts and grands, parents. And as uh, we celebrate this day, Mothering Day, Lord, we want to recommit ourselves that we may continue to be your children. Remember that you are our father and our mother who takes care of us all the time. And your love is constant for us. 
And children, as you now go to your Sunday school, may you continue to experience the compassion and love of your families, especially on this day, your mothers. And the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Today's first reading is Numbers, chapter 13, verses 25 to 33, and that can be found on page 143 in the Old Testament. After exploring the land for 40 days, the spies returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Haran. They reported what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had brought. They said to Moses, We explored the land and found it to be rich and fertile, and here is some of its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and their cities are very large and well fortified. Even worse, we saw the descendants of the giants there. Amalekites live in the southern part of the land. Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And Canaanites live by the Mediterranean Sea and along the River Jordan. Caleb silenced the people who were complaining against Moses and said, We should attack now and take the land. We are strong enough to conquer it. But the men who had gone with Caleb said, No, we are not strong enough to attack them. The people there are more powerful than we are. So they spread a false report among the Israelites about the land they had explored. They said that the land doesn't even produce enough to feed the people who live there. Everyone we saw was very tall. And we even saw giants there, the descendants of an ark. We felt the smallest grasshoppers, and that is how we must have looked up to them. reading is Mark chapter 9 verses 9 to 24 and that can be found on page 58 of the New Testament. As they came down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has risen from death. They obeyed his order, but among themselves they, did, they started discussing the matter. What does this rising from death mean? And they asked Jesus, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah has to come first? His answer was, Elijah is indeed coming first in order to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man will suffer much and be rejected? I tell you, however, that Elijah has already come and that the people treated him just as they pleased, as the scriptures say about him. When they joined the rest of the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and saw some teachers of the law arguing with them. When the people saw Jesus, they were greatly surprised and ran to, the, ran to him and greeted him. Jesus asked his disciples, Why, What are you arguing with them about? A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought my son to you because he has an evil spirit in him and cannot talk. Whenever the spirit attacks him, it throws him to the ground and he foams at the mouth, grits his teeth and becomes stiff all over. I asked your disciples to drive the spirits out, but they could not. Jesus said to them, How unbelieving you people are. How long must I stay with you? How long do I have to put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him to Jesus. As soon as the spirit saw Jesus, it threw the boy into a fit, so that he fell on the ground and rolled round, foaming at the mouth. How long has he been like this? Jesus asked the father. Ever since he was a child, he replied. Many times the evil spirit had tried to kill him by throwing him in the fire and into water. Have pity on us and help us if you can. Yes, said Jesus. If you yourself can, everything is possible for the person who has faith. The father at once cried out, I do have faith, but not enough. Help me to have more. May God bless this reading of his soul. Let us sing together. Now, mission please, number 400. Lead us, Heavenly Father, lead us. Through this Lent, uh, we continue uh, with a series of being in the wilderness. What does it feel like being in the wilderness? And what goes through 
people's minds through lives as they find themselves in that place. Today I want to look at the time of wilderness is a time of doubt. And so today we are going to look at one of these specific, specific things we learn when we find ourselves in the wilderness. And I believe God can use it to move us from places of doubt to trust. Israelites, as we heard this morning, came to a place called Kadesh Barnea, which is at the entrance of Canaan. Remember, they came out of Egypt and they wanted to go to Canaan. That, is the, that was the promised land. And there they came at the entrance of it. And here they sent 12 spies into the land to explore it and bring back the report. So as they brought this report back to people, the initial reaction of the people is to doubt. They see how strong the people of that land are and don't believe that they will be able, able to overcome them. And as we read the, their story, it seems uh, quite astonishing that they would be so doubtful after seeing God's mighty hand upon them. He provided them again and again during their journey. But still, they have this doubt in their mind. But we need to remember that they were used to being weak and oppressed. For 450 years, they were slaves to Egyptians. And so it was very natural for them to, to, to feel uh, doubt and uncertainty when faced this kind of situation. It is natural for anyone to feel doubt in difficult times. So as we navigate through life, we rely on our experience and our knowledge to guess, get us through that time. When we are thrust into uh, suffering and difficulty, suddenly our paradigm is shifted. Our beliefs, convictions and even our theology and values are thrown out of uh, normal routine. We have no point of reference in this situation which makes us unsure and, uh, uh, and our future causing us to worry and doubt. This is what the Israelites uh, were facing. As I said, for over hundreds of years, they were oppressed and lived as a weak people. When they saw the strength of the Canaanites, they were immediately afraid. They knew Egypt. But God was trying to get them to embrace the Canaan, the promised land. And here they find themselves not believing that, doubting that. We must remember doubt on its own is not too bad. But if left unchecked, it has a dangerous trend. It can turn us into and to people we don't want to become. We see this pattern with the Israelites in this chapter that we just heard. First, it turns them into skeptics. In verse 27, they recognize that the land is fruitful, but they also notice that the people there were powerful. At this point, they are not condemning the land, so to speak, but they aren't taking a stand for it. And that's what a skeptic does. Someone who refuses to commit to anything because they fear being wrong. They are so doubtful of their own ability to. Instead, they stay on the sidelines. You see, in wilderness time, just about everything is tested and called into question. 
Remember, we looked at Jesus' own story being in the wilderness. He was tested for everything. And everything that was said to him by Satan was actually bringing doubt into his mind. In that kind of situation, doubt is often part of the experience. Our cry in the wilderness is often the cry of the Father recorded in our second reading. And so it should be if it is not. I believe. Help my unbelief. Increase my faith. The cry of that father seeking healing for his son was not the first such cry, nor would it be the last one. People of faith down through the ages, including the greatest Christians that we have a lot of respect for, have experienced doubt in their wilderness time. And let me read it to you, uh, one of them, uh, the, 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 the words of one of the uh, great heroes that uh, uh, we recently had in, in, in our Christian history. I call, I claim, I want, and there is no one to answer. No one, no, no one whom I can claim. No, no one. Alone, where is my faith? Even deep down right in there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. My God, how painful is this unknown pain. I have no faith. So many unanswered questions lay within me afraid to uncover them because of the blasphemy. If there be God, please forgive me. I am told God loves me and yet the reality of darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. Did I make a mistake in surrendering uh, surrendering blindly to the call of the sacred father or sacred heart. Who do you think these words came from? These words are written by Mother Teresa and we all know she was known for devoting her life to help others being Jesus' hands and feet to those in need. But when you read her writings, it is amazing to find out that she was just like us and just like the Israelites. She had her own doubts. Unfortunately, we in the church have often dismissed and discounted doubts as the product of an immature faith. Although sitting in any congregation on any given Sunday morning are many people who have unresolved issues of faith and belief. And so it is critically important that the church be a safe place where these doubts can be raised without the questioner uh, being made to feel like a second class Christian. I have taught courses during my, my visits on that particular issue, so especially in lament. It is very hard to get through and to break that tradition and not being called a second class Christian when you raise some doubts. However, the important truth is this. That the doubt is a part of our faith journey. You see, most Christians experience it at one time or, uh, or another, especially in the time of wilderness. Some Christians experience it a number of times throughout their lives. Doubt is a part of Christian journey. But doubt is not a good destination, as someone has said. We must remember that. Doubt is a part of our journey, but it is not a good destination, any more than the wilderness is a good destination. It is not intended to be a stopping place. Doubt calls us into some action. 
it moves us and moves us forward. There is a big difference between doubting and giving up. There is an immense difference between wrestling with faith and throwing it out altogether. There is a big difference between moving through doubt and getting stuck there and becoming a cynic. You see, the healthy way of understanding doubt is to understand it as a part of our faith journey. The key to doubt being a journey and not being a destination is caring about God and wanting to move to faith and to keep moving. Just as the Father said, I believe, please help my unbelief. The good news is this that the doubt we experience in the wilderness times can actually be beneficial to us because doubt stimulates us and pushes us on to faith, on to moving on. You know, a writer called Frederick, uh, Frederick Buchner wrote, wrote this, he said, if you don't have any doubts, you are either kidding yourself or asleep. Doubts are the ants and the pants of faith. They keep it awake and moving. Interestingly, God's most faithful servants, as I've just mentioned earlier, have usually also been among the most doubtful people. Be it Moses, be it David, Elijah, so and so forth. We tend to think of doubt as the opposite of faith. But in reality, apathy is the opposite of faith. And so this morning, I want to say if faith, uh, doubt is part of our faith journey, then doubt is not the opposite of faith, but a part of it. A poet called Alfred Lord Tennyson put it this way, he says, there, life, there lives more faith than honest doubt, believe me, than half the creeds. And so if doubt is a part of our wilderness experience, what do we do with our doubts? Let me just suggest two, three things this morning. First of all, we should not suppress our doubts. Authentic faith begins with intellectual honesty and the doubt is the foundation of that honesty. Ask the questions and continue to search for it. Don't let your doubt stop up, uh, stop the channel to God. Let doubts open the channels in new ways with new insights and new understanding. May we pray, just as the father of that son uh, said, I believe, help my unbelief. The second thing, we should stay involved with other Christians. And this is critically important. People say that I don't need church, I can sit at home, I can be Christian, I can be a good person, good Christian too. Well, there might be some grain of truth in that, but not all. And the second point is about that. We should stay involved with other Christians. We could learn a lesson here from the disciple Thomas. Remember who voiced his serious doubts about the resurrection and yet continued to remain in the company for other disciples as he worked through those doubts. Group support and sharing is a powerful way we can 
share our patterns and find support for moving through periods of doubts to trust and faith. And third and last, we should continue to seek Christ and faith in Christ. The issue for us is never, therefore, one of the avoiding doubts as if that will cure us of them. Rather, it is continue to have an honest relationship with God. Prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 29, verse 13, he says, When you search for me, you will find me. Jesus also said, didn't he? Ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. When, we, when do we do these things? Our periods of doubt and questions can lead us to faith. And that is what I want to emphasize this morning. In wilderness, everything is tested. Doubts do come to our minds. But let not that doubt be a destination. Let it be a part of our experience, Christian experience, journey, so it can push us forward. The prime example is found in the book of Psalms. As you go through Psalms, you can pick up Psalms and read and you can see the writer is raising immense doubts in the beginning of his psalm. And then it moves through that psalms towards the end. He comes to that trust and faith in God again. That is a journey of faith. When the writer, the psalmist, finds himself in wilderness, it pushes him forward to find more close fellowship with God. In other words, he's saying, help my unbelief. I do believe it's not enough. Increase my faith. Let us think about that this morning. Amen. We continue worshipping God and we bring our offerings. Uh, and as we do so, we sing Mission Praise number 111. Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, once again, the time of being in your presence. Listening to you, offering our desires to you, our needs to you, expressed in quietness through the words of these hymns, through prayers. Lord, we ask you to receive them and let your will be done for us as we continue to go through the times of wilderness, as we continue to go through the times of doubt. May the doubt never be a destination. May it always push us to get closer to you. Lord, this morning we especially pray for those who are in the time of wilderness, who are doubting their own identity, their own faith. We remember the people of Iraq, Syria, Nigeria, and many parts of the world. We especially remember the time of wilderness when people feel confused, when their faith is shaken. This morning, remember the people of Pakistan where two churches have been attacked. People have lost their lives. There is a anger, there is a doubt, there is uncertainty. Lord, we pray for all those people. And we ask you to, Lord, help them move forward, move on. Help them to hold on to faith. May they come to this point where they say, I believe, but help me at my unbelief. At this time, may they feel your love. May they hear this voice of 
calm in their heads. We pray for those who have lost their children, friends, family members. Lord, bring peace to these grieved families. We also pray for our own congregation, the people that are going through the time of wilderness, going through doubt, time of loss. Lord, help their unbelief. As a congregation, increase our faith. We also pray for those who are weak in our congregation, physically, mentally, emotionally. We pray for strength. We pray for this resolve to carry on and to move on. And now, Lord, as we bring these offerings to you, we ask you to receive them, multiply them, and use them for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen. <laughs> and let us now conclude our service this morning and uh, ask, Lord, to take our life once again and let it be. Mission praise number 624. Take my life and let it be. And now as you go from here, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever.